Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia. My name is Sandra Lane. I am the president of the club. And you forgive me, this is probably one of the only times I'm allowed to do this. Two some tuck with the comment of club. A very long way. Iceland he is the WikiLeaks editor in chief, Christian Huffinson. And he's here to talk about Julian Assange, who is uh, lingering in a jail cell in London, and there are calls for him to be released and not extradited to the United States. Christian, welcome to the club. Thank you. Thank you for this warm welcome introduction. Sabra, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you at Australia's National Press Club on uh, Nongawa land. I pay my respect to Nongawa elders, past, present, and emerging. I have come a long way from Iceland's wintry darkness to be here in the homeland of Julian Sands on the anniversary of the Eureka Stock Trade, uh, which was an important uh, turning point in your democratic history, I believe. Yes. And <clears throat> had an implication uh, for the history of, of the press in this country as well. But today, Julian Assange is about as far from the sunshine and beauty of this place as it is possible to be. I wish I didn't have to convey to you what it's like in Belmar's prison. It's a brick and wire hell of sensory deprivation. It is no place for a journalist or a publisher, and it's no place for an Australian who comes from this bright and warm place. After just a few hours of visiting Julian in that place, I find myself very angry and almost stripped of hope. Julia has been there for six months now, mostly alone in the cell for over 20 hours a day, virtually in solitary confinement. I don't know how much longer he can last. He is a resilient and strong man, and I should know I have worked with him closely for 10 years, but he is no longer the man I met back then. He has sacrificed everything to publish what whistleblowers have entrusted to Wikileaks. And every release comes from leaks. Wikileaks does not hack. It publishes what whistleblowers provide. And we keep on doing so because whistleblowers keep trusting Wikileaks with material. Recently, whistleblowers entrusted Wikileaks with documents about bribery, money laundering, and corruption, with fraud files, Two ministers in Namibia have just been forced to resign, and early today they were charged because they have revealed to be corrupt and taking bribes. Another whistleblower recently provided an email communication from, to then Chief of Cabinet of the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, Bob Fairweather. The email was from someone who was in the inspection team that visited the site of an alleged chemical weapons attack in Duma in Syria in April 2018. And remember that this alleged <coughs> chemical weapon attack saw Syria bombed by the US, France and the UK. The email outright accuses the leadership of OPCW of omitting information and misrepresenting the facts. The emails also show how much pressure the US was bringing to bear on an organization that is supposed to be independent and impartial. Julian has sacrificed everything so that whistleblowers can shine light on these kinds of serious wrongdoing, so the public can understand truths about our world and for the principles of press freedom. He should not be tortured, as the UN torture expert states in his occurring. He should not be extradited for publishing. He should not face 175 years in a US jail for publishing information about wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and activities in Guantanamo Bay, which is what he, he charges related to. 
He should not face jail for informing Australians and the rest of the world about the true nature of the wars we are fighting in. It is time to bring this Australian citizen home. What I want to discuss with you today is the fate of journalism and Julian. I look forward to your questions and thoughts. But before I discuss who or what is a journalist, when government secrecy is legitimate or excessive, let me say some thank yous. I want to thank Kerry O'Brien, one of your finest journalists, for what he said at the World Trade last week. He made an important speech about the fate of journalism. For those of you who weren't there, this is what he said. Julian Assange is smoldering in a British prison, awaiting extradition to the United States, where he may pay for their severe embarrassment with a life in prison. Again, this government could demonstrate its commitment to a free press by using its significant influence with its closest ally to gain his return to Australia. I want to thank everyone who applauded when he said that, and it was almost all of the Australian journalists there. I agree also with the leader of the MEAA, the Journalists' Union in this country, of which Julian has been a card-carrying member since 2007. Thank you, Paul Murphy, Chief Executive of the MEAA, for saying at the workplace, quote, Julian Assange may be extradited to the United States to possibly face a lifetime in prison. Among the charges, he is accused of publishing material that could harm the national security of the United States. The scope of these words should alarm every journalist. There was loud applause when, he, when the, this was said too. Because Australian journalists get what is at stake, particularly after the raids on the ABC and on the journalists' home in this town, and some have understood this all along. And here I mean journalists and writers like Philip Adams, Frank Kelly, Andrew Fowler, Bernard Keane, and Guy Rundle. These journalists have made a consistent effort to wade through the complexities of Julian's case to see the simple truths at stake, principally those about press freedom. I want to thank Scott Bruton, who is here today. For many years, one could have been forgiven for thinking only one Australian parliamentarian understood the danger arising from so many national security laws and the significance of the persecution of a publisher for publishing. But now I can also thank Andrew Wilkie MP and George Christensen MP, who co-chair the Bringing Julian Assange Home Parliamentary Group. This group is an eclectic mixture of people from across the spectrum of politics who can all agree that it is time to see Julian Assange arrive back in Australia a free man. So thank you for getting it. Barnaby Joyce, Rebecca Sharkey, Rex Patrick, Julian Hill, Steve Georgianos, Richard Finato, Adam Mann, Peter Wiswilson, and Sally Stita. I also want to thank someone here today who is in court tomorrow for a peaceful protest climbing onto your parliament with a banner that read, Free Julian Assange, No U.S. Extradition. I hope the judge you face is similar to the magistrate and other protesters faced in Melbourne last, last week for peacefully protesting at the UK consulate. That magistrate stated that some would commend the person for occupying the UK consulate and did not oppose a conviction or a good behaviour bond but a $400 fine. <coughs> I want to thank the doctors who signed a statement of concern about Julian's health one of who is here today. Thank you, Dr. Sue Wareham. And how can I not acknowledge and thank Julian's parents, whose agony it is difficult to imagine. Christine, Julian's mother, once said that as a mother, she wishes <coughs> Julian had never started Wikileaks. But as a citizen, she was proud of her son and supported Wikileaks and its aims. That is the kind of person who raised Julian, a person of principle, who thinks like a citizen. It becomes clear through knowing his parents how Julian came to be Julian. I am a parent myself, and as a parent, I truly don't know how they have endured 10 years of their son being mercilessly smeared while watching his deterioration, suffering, and isolation. And for what? 
for publishing material that, as Kerry O'Brien said, embarrassed the United States. But Wikileaks wasn't alone, and very often wasn't first in publishing documents on Guantanamo, Iraq, and Cablegate back in 2010 and 2011. We partnered with some media organization in this country and with Der Spiegel in Germany, The Guardian in the UK, and The New York Times in the United States, and many others. And that is also worth a thank you, the power of what we collectively made available to the public about wars and war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq, about crimes against humanity at Guantanamo Bay. It was worthwhile and it changed things. Not enough things, but some for the better. At the time, many agreed and welcomed Wikileaks, which was awarded the War Play Award for Most Outstanding Contribution to Journalism in 2011. There are dozens of other awards Julian has received, three journalism prizes this year alone. I continue to believe that Wikileaks and very many media outlets were right to expose what has happened in our names. The United States is trying to prosecute an Australian citizen, who's not even in the United States, but in Europe, a gross overreach into the sovereign territory of other countries and a dangerous president. And what president does this set? It is a new form of forced rendition. Only this time, not with a sack over the head and an orange job shoot, but with the enabling of the UK legal system with the apparent support of the Australian government. If Russia and China were doing this to an Australian journalist, we'd be hearing a lot more about it, and we will, if this president is that. I strongly believe that resolving this issue has important international implications. Prolonging it creates an enabling environment for a deterioration of press freedom standards globally. All around the world, media organizations, prominent individuals, and grassroots campaign efforts are growing and expressing concern by lobbying and by taking protest action. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and The Guardian have expressed great concern about the charges he faces. UK Special Envoy on Media Freedom, Amal Clooney, stated at the June Global Conference for Media Freedom, the charges criminalize common practices in journalism, which the American Civil Liberties Union has warned, established a dangerous precedent that can be used to target all news organizations that hold the government accountable by publishing its secrets. The bottom line is that the fate of Julian and journalism around the world are entwined. Now let me address the question of whether Julian Assange is a journalist. Uh, it's actually pretty insulting, to be honest. I'm recognized as a journalist, but I don't uh, need awards to know what I was doing. I was journalist for 20 years before I joined Wikileaks, and for the 10 years since I did. And the High Court of the United Kingdom is not confused on this matter. It described Julian as, quote, a journalist, well known through his operation of Wikileaks, unquote, in the opening line of his uh, November 2nd, 2011 ruling. And the US Army Counterintelligence Center is similarly not confused. It described Wikileaks as, quote, news organization, unquote, and Assange as a writer, a journalist, that had shown journalistic responsibility to the newsworthiness or fair use of the classified document. Two relevant professional bodies for journalists are not confused either. The MEAA made it clear in 2007, and the Walkley Board in 2011, when Julian got the prestigious award, and the IFJ, the International Federation of Journalists, they gave him his international journalist card. The US indictment documents against Julian describe routine journalistic practices. The first relates to taking measures to protect the identity of a source, and the remaining 17 charges relate to receiving and publishing information. 
The prosecution is being pursued under the Espionage Act. The first use against a publisher in US history. It is a prosecution in which there is no public interest defense. Alan Rusbicher, former editor of The Guardian, who acknowledges Turin as a journalist and surely is qualified to do so, described the journalistic activities in the charges as the kind of activity that honorable journalists do all the time. Wikileaks has experienced and challenged some journalistic practices, and as Hart Cohen and Antonio Castillo say in the Global Media Journal, it has also changed the way we think about the rules and how. What Wikileaks did when it was first established in 2006 was to provide technological anonymity and untraceability to whistleblowers and sources. This is a bit similar to what the ABC installed last week, secure drop, and what the Guardian and the New York Times caught up with a few years ago by installing it too. Wikileaks was out in front in understanding the implication of the internet for journalism, its promise and potential for protecting sources, for realizing new ways, a network for the state, could provide information to the public and other media outlets and are now applying those learnings. What Wikileaks specializes in is the analysis and publication of large data sets of censored or otherwise restricted official materials involving international relations or spying and corruption. When he could speak for himself, Julian often referred to how an archive, rather than a few selected documents, can shine light on how human institutions actually behave, how they evolve, how power is exercised, and in is, it is the archive being made public, and not a few selected documents, that has been the scale to deal with the problems of corrupt institutions. Now, is there a time and place for secrecy? Well, of course there is. Wikileaks uses it extensively, and so do governments. And it is legitimate when there are delicate diplomatic engagements underway, when it's about dangerous material, for all sorts of reasons. But what we have seen so much, and what we have re revealed, is how rampant secrecy has become, and how corruption thrives and becomes epidemic under conditions of secrecy. We have also revealed the unresolvable over-classification of documents when governments should not hide all their actions behind official secrecy <coughs> while seeking to know more and more about, about every one of us. To speak of a balance between government secrecy and the public's right to know is to not acknowledge how serious, out of balance, these things have become. It is a re journalist's responsibility to publish and inform the public and undo unnecessary secrecy, just like we journalists must keep our sources secret. We have necessity to do that. It is not our responsibility to protect intelligence agencies or protect police if they act in an incompetent or unlawful way. Or when a whistleblower has risked everything because something is very wrong and only sunlight can halt the wrong thing <coughs> in its track. As Andrew Fowler, another great Australian journalist, has observed, Wikileaks is an old-fashioned idea about journalism reborn in the age of the internet. Now, did Julian Assange himself seek to redact the war logs and cables? Yes, as Mark Davis recently attested at the, at the Sydney the Politics in the Pub event, he witnessed Julian stay up night after night to do just that. The Harvard professor Jochai Benkler, who testified in the Manning trial, wrote a fine paper about the importance of a free and irresponsible press. By irresponsible, he meant not responsible to one group or another. He meant that it is the responsibility of the press to remain free and to publish that which powerful interests would prefer to be kept secret. When the ABC launched Secure Drop last week, this comment was made. It's a sad commentary on our times that secure drop is necessary. 
we hope one day it isn't. Similarly, it's a sad commentary on our times that Wikileaks is necessary. We hope one day it isn't. For now, while whistleblowers keep trusting our platform with information, it is. And we will keep publishing. The UK-US extradition treaty <coughs> stipulates that if an offence is political, extradition from the UK must not proceed. Well, the extradition of Julian to the US must not proceed. The charges against Julian are political and being used in a political way to deter <coughs> journalism and publishing. The US authorities have spied on him, including live web streaming of his meetings with lawyers and colleagues, including from the embassy's toilets for years. An attempt was made to blackmail Wikileaks to extract 3 million euros, from me in fact, in exchange for these surveillance materials collected by Spanish firm Undercore Global. This matter is now before the Spanish courts, but gives a lot of insight into the lengths the superpower has been prepared to go. The German national broadcaster has filed a criminal complaint about this firm's spying on its journalists visiting the embassy. I have traveled 10 time zones to be here today because there are things you can do in defense of your colleague and your profession that we can't do from London or my hometown in Reykjavik. You are able to ensure that timely and accurate information about the importance of this case reaches a wide Australian audience. You are able to disarm and dismiss the ruthless misinformation campaign that this is somehow about Sweden or the treatment of his cat or corruption within the US Democratic Party. In keeping the focus on the indictments for publishing, you keep the focus on the truth. You can ask him, and you are in, in, in a position of facing the Prime Minister and his colleagues day after day, sometimes eye to eye. And you can ask him what he has done to get Julian home. How has he stood up for his fellow citizen? Your government did take steps to secure the freedom of James Richardson, also of Melinda Taylor, also of Peter Grist. And please be direct. Please be insistent. As for details, not platitudes, please be unrelenting and prepare to back each other when the inevitable invitation occurs. You, above all, are able to distinguish between publishing and espionage, a distinction that the US government and its allies seem intent on erasing. And you know as well as I that if they are successful in this, then Julian Assange will not be the last of our colleagues to have his life destroyed in this line of work. Look around this room today. You each have a role in the political ecosystem that keeps that helps keep things safe for everyone else. I know you're under a great deal of pressure, but this is where we must draw the line. <coughs> As our friends in the union movement say, an injury to one is an injury to all. Please help us get our colleague and our friends safely home. Australia at the moment is engaged in a debate about secrecy, whistleblowing and journalism, especially around national security. This is a very old debate because journalism at its core will always be about power, about subjecting the powerful and the way they use power to scrutiny and overcoming the resistance to that and supporting those want to hold them accountable. What's changed is that the internet has given journalists and whistleblowers more tools to undertake that process, but also given the powerful more tools to resist and to attack those who try to subject them to scrutiny. Thus we have an old conflict being fought on new battlefields, in new media and on new devices and platforms. But the stakes are perhaps greater than they have ever been before. Thank you. Could you give us 
um, an idea of just what Julian's health is like. You, you've said that you, you're concerned about his health. The doctors signed, uh, 60 doctors signed a letter uh, last week saying that his health was at risk. What, and I think you last visited him in October, so I'm not sure that you, can, can you give us an idea yes, of I, his I, health? I, I have been able to visit him uh, about four times since he was arrested in this uh, uh, despicable manner uh, in, in April. Uh, he, of course, he came from a bad place after all these years inside the Equatorian Embassy. So, uh, uh, being thrown into that, uh, that, uh, that uh, prison uh, designed to uh, uh, intimidate and, uh, and and actually, in fact, his, his conditions are worse. And I've, I've said, I've, I've had that from lawyers who have presented uh, uh, terrorists who are, are serving time in Ghana's prison. They have actually a better uh, environment to, uh, to, to, uh, to cope with the situation than Julian has. Um, he is mostly in isolation uh, for 20 hours a day. Uh, to give an uh, 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 an example of how he is treated there. He is always the, uh, when I go to visit him, he's always either the first or the last one to enter the visitation hall. And that is because they empty the hallways when he goes from the cell into the visitation And for what reason? One does not understand. And I've seen him grow thinner. He has lost probably 10, 15 kilos in these few months. Uh, He's pale, and he's short, he has a hard time to think, he's constantly wearing airplugs because of the noise, and uh, I basically see life fading out of his life, and I'm, I am really concerned about his health. This is just a, no place for an individual of his stature, no place for a journalist, no place for an Australian citizen who has done nothing wrong but exposed the truth. And that letter did, uh, how is that received by the officials? If you're referring to the officials in the UK, I, I have not heard of any reaction. They are uh, becoming master of uh, dismissing anything in support of Julian Assange. Unbelievably, they dismissed the uh, finding of a, a very important human rights tribunal, the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, that found that when he was in the embassy, he was being arbitrarily detained. And that uh, panel in Geneva basically ordered the United Kingdom and Sweden to resolve the situation. It was dismissed as nonsense. Uh, the uh, politicians there said uh, they are misunderstanding. They don't understand the laws here. And when this, this, this was presented as a mitigating evidence to, uh, in the court uh, this spring, uh, in order for him to at least get a, the usual sentence of a fine for breaching bail. The uh, judge said that I was present there. The United Nations ruling to have not have any bearings in my courtroom. And that was after she had uh, snarled at Julian and called him a narcissist, even though she was seeing him for, for the first time behind bulletproof glass, and he had only said his name and date of birth. So I don't think that unless organizations and individuals start pushing against the authorities in the United Kingdom, and I hope politicians on this side start picking up the phone and put a pressure on the system in the United Kingdom, that things will change. Because he must get out of there. I mean, it's absolutely impossible to think that an individual who's preparing for a case the most important case of his life, he's fighting for his life in February, that he has not, not a position to prepare the case. It's only two or three weeks ago that he actually got uh, papers to read on his own defense case. I mean, that's totally unacceptable. How can this happen in a, a civilized country? So, this has to change, and I'm hoping that pressure will come from this side of the world for it to change. When we spoke this morning, about six hours ago, you had uh, an appointment with the Foreign Minister, Bruce Payne. Has that changed? <sighs> no. Not yet. Are you hopeful? I am always hopeful. 
you have to be moved. I, uh, I have been hard in the, just in a few days. Uh, I, I know I've had some in the air that I'm uh, drawing a dark uh, picture. But uh, since I arrived here, I've met a lot of journalists here and uh, a lot of supporters, and I felt that there is a growing sense of knowledge of the importance of fighting this case, fighting for freedom of doing. And uh, uh, that gives you, gives you hope. And I think there's a momentum coming, and people are more and more understanding the importance of this, not just for Julian, for all journalists, not just in this country, but around the world, and for the public, because we're talking about the foundation of our democracy. This is, this is the thing. So uh, let it be the, uh, the pushback against the, the two decades of, uh, of absurd uh, deterioration of our human rights. And uh, I hope that the freedom of Julian will be the first step in the right direction because we have certainly been in the wrong direction for 20 years. Catherine Murphy. Hello. Thank you for coming all the way to Canberra uh, for um, making this speech here today. I have two questions. Uh, the first sort of picks up from uh, Sabra's question to you about uh, ministers or meeting with the foreign minister and so forth. Obviously, particularly over the last couple of months, WikiLeaks has had more purchase in uh, in politics. This group has been formed, a uh, cross-party group, in order to raise awareness about uh, Assange and the extradition. But then how do you deepen that into uh, engagement at the government level? Because the government's showing absolutely no sign of rallying to this cause. So that's the first question. The second to you is in your capacity as uh, the editor of WikiLeaks and it relates to the US election. Uh, Julian Assange issued a statement in, uh, I think it was, let me check the date, sorry, November 2016, uh, just about the disclosure of the Clinton material. He said that the intention was not to influence the result of the US election. Now, journalists face these dilemmas all the time. What are the consequences of disclosures? Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I'm sure that those disclosures about the Clinton material did impact the election result in the US. Has, uh, the, Wiki, has the WikiLeaks organisation had any cause post the election of Donald Trump to regret the fact that no material was published about the Trump campaign or any other candidates in that election, given his own behaviour, given what has been uh, disclosed during the course of his bitterly contested presidency? If I start from the, 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 the end, do I have any regrets, regrets about not publishing anything about Donald Trump? Well. The regret would then be not receiving anything of importance that we could authenticate and, uh, and publish. Uh, it is uh, perceived as, as, as we were, uh, we, uh, we do, not, do not pick targets in that sense. I mean, we are, we are people are given information. Uh, and if we had information that was of the sort, that it was in the public interest to publish it, and we could authenticate it, we would have. So maybe the regret is that no whistleblower, no source, this of information of that sort of words. Um, but the question about uh, influencing the outcome of elections and how journalists should somehow now, in, in many people's minds, stay away from <laughs> politics prior to election is mind-boggling, to say the least. I thought that the role of journalists in a democratic society was to uh, unearth secrets and influence and, and educate the public so they could go to the, uh, to the voting booth as an informed citizen. So exposing the politicians prior to election is part of what we are supposed to be doing. And I've, I've, I've been told do you regret that we can use the publish the, uh, the, this information prior to the 2016 election? And I, and, I, and I said this to Julian as well. I said, if that had been withheld, it had been a journalistic crime, I would have left the organization if I'd heard of that, that to happen. And, uh, 
And that is my belief. We should, of course, especially prior to election, educate the public about what the politics are about. Uh, I spoke about the uh, uh, revelation in Namibia about uh, uh, bribed officials there. Uh, two of them are in jail, and, uh, and uh, the Minister of Fisheries and Minister of Justice. Uh, the revelation came out three weeks before the election. Uh, there was nobody saying in Namibia that uh, this was a, um, an interference into the electoral process or an attempt to influence the outcome of the Swapo party, who actually went from getting 97% votes down to 57 in the presidential race, which is a, an outcome that hardly may be a result of this, uh, this revelation. But in my mind, to have not published it until after the election would have been such a betrayal that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it, it would be a, a journalistic crime not to do so. So that is my general sort of approach to this debate. And uh, why should there be any uh, different approach to things in Namibia or the United States? Uh, in many ways, the United States thinks that they are above principles and uh, a different set of rules should apply. Now, you also asked about the, the politicians here. I'm hoping to meet with politicians, and I rely, of course, on, on, on the support group uh, uh, in this city, in this country, who know the lay of the land better than I do. But I've been heartened to see that former politicians or prominents have been coming out, um, even for a minister at the time that this uncomfortable truths were exposed uh, uh, in speaking on Julian Assange's behalf. And uh, I think that, uh, that there is a spillover, there's a growing concerns in the community, and there will be a, a, a cross-party uh, uh, unity on, on fighting for, for Julian Assange coming back to this country. Sarah Eisen. Sarah Eisen from The West Australian, thank you so much for speaking. Um, I wanted to know if you could articulate a little bit more your response to the action of other inaction of the Australian government, also from travelling so much internationally. If you can tell me what the perception of that inaction is on the international stage. Um, well, I was uh, uh, in the uh, Bundestag in Germany and just two days before boarding a plane down to this side, and uh, I, I, got, I got that question from uh, German, German politicians, and uh, I didn't have the answers, and they were puzzled why the Australian government hadn't done more uh, throughout the years. Uh, I did not have the answer. I, I could point out the strategic alliance and historical alliance, uh, but this is just uh, something that everybody knows about. Uh, but. Uh, it is puzzling to, to many on, the, on that side, and uh, um, I do not have the answers, but, but I, yes, I do have recognized that there is a, there is a, a question and uh, um, a disbelief that more has not been done. Tim Shaw. Tim Shaw, member of the National Press Club Board. In June of 2012, I interviewed Julian live from London, and he said to me, quote, I was trying to play a very precarious game with the United States and I had 251,000 US diplomatic cables in my pocket. I asked him if he was a technology terrorist or a titan of transparency. And he referred to then US Vice President Joe Biden, who's now a Democratic candidate in the 2020 elections. And uh, Vice President Biden referred to him as a high-tech terrorist today. If you had 251,000 cables delivered to you, you know your responsibilities and your methodologies. Would you do anything different to what Julian and WikiLeaks did back then? No, we of course learn from experience, and uh, but uh, in, in essence, this was the right approach. And remember, this was not a, a dumped on the internet all at once. Even though that is sometimes the feeling I get when I when I see the. The, the constant accusation of irresponsible uh, data dumping without any, uh, re, uh, any, any, any filtering or any, any sort of curating, which is nonsense. Uh, all these releases that are now uh, uh, the basis of these indictments, the Afghan uh, war documents, the Iraq war documents, and the diplomatic cables, uh, they were curated of some, uh, in some way. I mean, the one third of the Afghan uh, documents were withheld in the summer of, of 2010. Um, all the Iraq uh, 
documents were redacted in a systematic manner. And uh, uh, the uh, diplomatic cables were drip-fed out over 10 months, and we only stopped that sort of process in coordination and in cooperation with, with almost 100 news organizations all around the world who, uh, who put their expertise in, uh, in analyzing and producing a story on the basis of these documents. So it was all but uh, an irresponsible throwing out of the, 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 the... On the contrary, I mean, it was... It, it, this ethnic method has become a model for others. Uh, international media alliances, like the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism, who uh, produced the Panama Papers. Uh, it had other organizations on a more local level, like in Eastern Europe. Uh, even now there's an African one. So, so this is a, cro a model for cross-border cooperation. And, but this, this method that we use over these 10 months, and it was only because of uh, rather irresponsible behavior of, uh, of the Guardian journalists who published secret passwords to uh, a file that was online, that uh, the entire thing was released. But I remember in the first weeks of uh, the Cablegate project, we were constantly being hammered by the fact that we were drip feeding this out to the world. Why are you holding this back? You know, so the opposite was true. We were harshly criticized for not dumping everything. So of course the other journalists could all dive in and, and uh, write stories on it. So it's hard to please, but uh, this was all, but no, it was not a, an irresponsible thing. And I think in essence, I would have done it in the same way. Uh, the same way, uh, and, uh, and uh, it, it had a great impact. Uh, at the time, it, sort of Latin America was a bit my experience. It's probably because I'm the only person within Wikileaks who does not speak Spanish, but uh, that's the way things go. And, uh, and you could see how much an effect it had. Uh, we were dealing with both big mainstream media organizations, but often with smaller uh, uh, grassroots media organizations, three or four people in editorial, really uh, uh, fighting against uh, uh, different social circumstances. And uh, it, it was uh, uh, very rewarding to, to take that on that trip. Uh, and maybe I can, I can, I can mention a little, little uh, uh, anecdote here about how people perceived Wikileaks at the time. Because you're absolutely true. You had screaming individuals, politicians and commentators in the United States at that time, who were calling for, you know, the killing, the assassination, the droning of WikiLeaks. Uh, the daughter of Dick Cheney actually wanted uh, the Pentagon to send a drone to Reykjavik because he thought that my home city was uh, the headquarters of WikiLeaks at the time. Uh, it, it was absurd. I mean, the madness that was going on. And you had the, the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, live from the Pentagon talking about the blood on their hands thing. You know, they might already have blood on their hands, and I was watching the, him, and I was thinking, my God, this man representing the U.S. military talking about anybody having blood on their hands. Mm -hmm. What an absurd yeah. thing, you know, almost in tears. <laughs> and ever since, so we just addressed this issue, because I know it's probably going to come up, mm -hmm. has any harm become because of this, these millions of documents that, that Wikis has produced over the years, and especially these documents from 2010. Well, in the many trial, the Pentagon was forced to, to come before the military court and admit that no physical harm had occurred because of this uh, release. And uh, to this day, we have not heard of any, uh, uh, any such incident. So, it is astonishing, and Orwellian, and even Kafka as well, if I start sort of throwing out uh, cliches, that the head of the US military is accusing Julian Assange and us at Wikileaks to have blood on their hands after we exposed all those things, the atrocities in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's that's absurd. Club's patron, Ken Randall. I'd like to ask you, this, although the Julian Assange case is far from over, well, it seems to be far from over, um, it has raised awareness and discussion of all the issues that you've raised today. Do you think it's advanced in any positive way any of those affecting journalists and journalism? Are you referring to that, this, that the case of Julian has affected 
other journalists and journalism in general, or the position, uh, security-wise, or... Uh, well, I mean, if, if I understood your question correctly, I, I'm, I, am, I am certain that already the, uh, the process that he's in, even though he hasn't been uh, uh, extradited or, or sentenced, uh, I have a feeling, of course I can say that for certain, that uh, the raids here in Australia this summer in June would not have happened if uh, he hadn't been dragged out of the embassy in April. And it seems that the incidents of these aggressive acts against journalists uh, have escalated in the last few months. So it seems that the, the precedent that I talked about, uh, the specific uh, question of extraterritorial reach that the US takes, has also has a, a, an effect on, on, on other actions that are enabled governments to take more uh, bolder steps. So I think it's already had an effect today. Merry Christmas, Keynes. Thank you. Kristen, when you joined WikiLeaks in 2010, you were Iceland's most highly acclaimed journalist. Now you've been there a decade, as have indeed the other core, many of the core members of the WikiLeaks group. That doesn't happen un unless you all believe in the objectives of the organisation, of course, but also that you all have respect for editor uh, Julian Assange, who um, uh, has been much maligned. I have two questions for you. Firstly, uh, what concerns do you have for your own freedom and safety and that of your staff? And secondly, if you could um, reflect for us, please, um, your uh, estimation of him as a human being. We came from a, a totally different uh, uh, sides of, of in, in our line of thought. He was from the early hacking days from Melbourne, um, from a time when hacking had, did not have a necessarily negative connotation. Uh, and I, from this, this sort of square mainstream media environment, mostly in broadcasting for 20 years, and, uh, uh, but probably considered somewhat radical in, in my approach and, uh, and not uh, 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 an easy person to deal with, um, I, I guess, if, if one takes into account the, uh, the, the time that I had to storm out of, of my working place, which was, I think, as often as I was awarded. But uh, we found a common uh, ground, and uh, we had long discussions, and it, they were always inspiring. Uh, we had uh, disagreements about certain things, but uh, we found common grounds. And uh, he listens well, and uh, he doesn't dismiss anything you say, so he's a, he's a, he's a good man to talk to, uh, a kind person a good sense of humor. Uh, he is anything but the, the strange character that has been uh, sort of portrayed in the, uh, the mainstream media at some levels, which is uh, the, uh, the result of this, uh, this uh, uh, slandering campaign that's been going on for 10 years. Uh, I don't know that person. That person doesn't exist in reality. Uh, this is what Niels Meltzer was referring to when he said that media, media was complicit as well in this public mobbing, uh, of which he has had uh, after his 20 years as a special rapporteur for torture. He had never seen anything like that before in a Western country. Um, so we got him well. Now. You talk about our security and our staff. Uh, we are, have been under threat. And this is the reason why we try to uh, limit the exposure that they are under. Uh, we try not to advertise the names. We have to, to try to secure their interests in, in, in any way we can. Uh, the three people that have, have been uh, on the surface uh, working for WikiLeaks uh, throughout this time uh, me, Sarah Harrison, and, uh, and Joseph Farrell. Uh, we uh, have all been a subject of the, uh, the same investigation that have been uh, since 2013. We learned that uh, a social media organization had all been in the US, had all been 
uh, demanded to hand over all the information about us. Uh, we only knew because one of that um, one of that uh, uh, that organization, Google, actually took uh, to the courts and demanded the right to tell their customers uh, us that uh, they had been forced by court order to hand over all the information they had on us. Uh, of course, it was rather it was Gmails, for example. Uh, the content of, of very little interest, at least in my case, uh, but the metadata, which uh, they were forced to hand over as well, which basically is a tracking uh, information, which has, uh, has is now used a lot in, in, uh, in court cases against individuals. And it seems to be going on. We don't know about everything that's going on, but uh, unfortunately, only this morning, I heard that uh, Thomas has been an, an artist that has worked uh, with WikiLeaks or for WikiLeaks or assisted WikiLeaks with campaign, uh, well, posters and, 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 and uh, graphic design, etc. That he had uh, learned of a, a, a similar court order to Google to hand over information about him. So not even artists that are uh, associated with the organization are safe, which is uh, astonishing. Tony Melville. Uh, Tony Melville, Kristen, um, uh, straight in, uh, I'm a director of the National Press Club. Uh, but um, there's a lot of serious stuff, obviously, in WikiLeaks, but one of my favourite cables was the William Bur Burns cable, US ambassador from the Chechen wedding. I don't know if you know that one. You can find it on the Guardian website where the, the president came in with a gold-plated uh, revolver in his uh, jeans and showering um, uh, dances with $100 bills. So it just revealed some of this classic stuff that was quite interesting to look at that you don't really see anymore and none of us see. Uh, my question's about the whistleblower word that you've used many times. Um, there are many whistleblower protection laws around the world, including in Australia and no doubt the US. What, what would you like to see about those laws that could be changed perhaps to, to protect publishers like yourself? It has been my impression, uh, travelling around and, and seeing the variations of the Civil Protection Act uh, on, uh, in several countries, that they are deeply flawed. They are deeply flawed on, on, on many way, in many, many ways. Uh, primarily because they, uh, uh, they demand a certain procedure that you have to comply with before you can get any protections of whistleblower. And uh, the, the most absurd demand is actually to expose yourself to your superior, to the head of the organisation. Uh, before you can actually go to the media. So, what, what my main concern, and these are usually, you know, of course, uh, acts written by government officials and, and passed by politicians who, are, who, are, who, who somehow put the media and journalists uh, uh, outside the framework. So, I mean, we have been many examples where, uh, uh, where uh, whistleblower have have actually had, uh, uh, including the NSA, have gone to their superior and raised concern about a certain issue. This happened in the NSA way before ever so. And, uh, and the individuals, they suffer as a result of it and are demoted, they are set aside because they're probably It's just for raising concerns. And then if something is uh, surfaced in the media, they are the first person that they go to. So they are exposing themselves to, to trouble. Uh, this is just one example. So uh, um, I, I worry that in many cases the whistleblower protection acts are, are, are basically uh, have an opposite effect. They are actually uh, stifling the, 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 the whistleblowers and, 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 and there's an attempt to actually stop them from blowing the whistle and, and get the information out. I don't necessarily know how to amend it, but I'm just, this is just a word of caution because originally I was much for it, uh, but I know how to get a, a, around this and strengthen this protection. Uh, but this is one of the flaws that are in the existing, existing acts uh, in, in many countries. I've seen it in Holland, where in Germany, in my own country, where a bill of such nature is now before Parliament. Um, so it's, it's of concern. Lisa Benedict, and I'm representing myself as a concerned citizen. Um, noting those who refer to Julian Assange as a technology terrorist generally have corrupt and nefarious acts they wish to cover up. How do the truth, me truth media platforms get the message out 
when all the major mockingbird media platforms are owned by the deep state, satanic bloodlines and nefarious elements of the intelligence agencies, especially when the body count of suicided whistleblowers are staggering, especially around the Clinton and Bush dynasties. How do we deal with this environment that you were describing? Well, um, I, I, I may have uh, <coughs> to get a, a, a little translation on, on the effect that how do we deal with this reality. We are talking about, of course, a very um, sad situation in the mainstream media world. I mean, journalism is under attack. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to, to see this happening in country after country. Uh, of course, there are economic concerns. You have giants, I mentioned Google before, to, Online giants are sucking 70, 80 percent of all advertising revenue, sucking the life out of the mainstream media, and I've talked, of course, taking a, a huge toll. Uh, this is happening at the same time as, as there's an attack on, on, on state broadcaster, and I, I, I do, was just made uh, aware of that a couple of days ago. This, the same thing is happening here in this country uh, against the ABC, as, as, as I'm seeing in, in other European countries. They are under attack. Uh, it's done by, by cutting the blood flow, the, cutting the budget. Uh, same, same, same things are happening in, in, in other, other countries with the state broadcasters. Um, and it creates an, an, an environment that is unhealthy. And this, on top of that, of course, it's all the, the, uh, the legal um, changes that are made and have been made post 9-11 with our uh, of great concern, uh, uh, basically eating away our, our, our press freedom and our liberties. Uh, somebody told me that there were over 70 such legislation in this country over the two decades, and it's, it's alarming. What can be done? Well, we have to keep uh, WikiLeaks alive, at least, and, uh, and uh, as a part of that, get Julian Assange out of prison and get him on a platform and uh, and start a worldwide campaign for the reversal of this situation. Wendy Bacon. I'm from the Pacific Media Centre. Yeah. Uh, Kristen, you have already um, spoken about how WikiLeaks has provided a contribution to journalism, innovated in journalism. You come from a mainstream background, as you said. I'm wondering if you could just add a little bit more, talk a little bit more about how the basic principles of journalism are applied in WikiLeaks. In particular, maybe around context, verification of documents, and considering what is in the public interest. How does your being as a journalist be applied in WikiLeaks? Well, in essence, it's, it's not very much different from any editorial uh, process. Uh, the, the, there, of course, is a discussion. You, you seek out expertise, expert opinions uh, on, uh, on material because it's also complicated. I can mention, for example, when we were uh, we got material on, on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement uh, negotiations that were actually stopped after we released uh, the, uh, the drafts uh, of that agreement. Uh, we sought out uh, and got assistance and contextualization from uh, labor unions, from experts on various fields, uh, who wrote uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, pieces about the context of the entire thing because there was a very broad scope there. It was about copyright. It was about uh, um, uh, so many, so many issues that are uh, about internet freedom uh, that are pertaining to to individuals. It's no different from uh, normal editorial, uh, and of course the verification process can often be difficult. Uh, but we've been extremely. We use the same experts, and we have access to a, a large group of experts who know uh, these documents and know how to verify. Them. And um, and I, I consider. I was very lucky, I think Wikis has been extremely lucky that over all these years there's not a single single document that has been called out as a, uh, a fabricated one or inauthentic. Everything is authentic, millions of documents, so there's not been a mistake so far. I'm not saying that it cannot happen at one time, there's, uh, but uh, as a track record, I think that's pretty good. So, I mean, there is in essence no, no, no huge difference. I mean, of course, we're working in a different environment. We produce uh, encrypted uh, 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 computation, you know, communication, uh, we think about, I need to think about security, uh, but uh, uh, you don't have uh, the, the, uh, 
the, the loud uh, editorial newsrooms, you know, which I was a bit used to before. Uh, not that I say that I miss it, but you know, so 20 years you've pretty much had enough of that. But, but it's, 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 uh, it's, it's in, in essence the same thing, although the technology and the platform is a bit different. It's the same, the same principle. Andrew Fowler. Thanks very much for your excellent talk, Kristen. That's really illuminating, <coughs> even for those of us that have spent a lot of time um, investigating and uh, looking at WikiLeaks. Um, you rightly point out that there has been a, a shift in sentiment among journalists. They now increasingly support Julian Assange. To what extent has that support grown as a result of journalists realizing that they could be next, that they could suffer the long reach of the American mm -hmm. Department of Justice and administration of that, uh, of that uh, country. To what extent is it that, or is it that they really have caught on to the fact that WikiLeaks is a fantastically positive force for journalism? It's a trick question, Andrew. You're, you're, basically, <laughs> you're basically asking me whether journalists are acting out of self-interest or, or, or high moral values. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be tricked into that one. <laughs> it's probably a mixture of both. And I mean, I think we both know that. Of course, there is self interest there. But I've, it, it, and, and let's hope there's also concern for the, uh, uh, the, the acknowledgement that this is an attack on, on their, their livelihood and their platform and their security. And uh, so it's not just self interest, because part of that self interest is, is, uh, is acknowledging that, uh, that uh, well, Let's hope and think that uh, the, the platform they stand on and uh, the duties that they have are a sacred value and are, above all are extremely important in our society. So a mix. <laughs> Cheryl Cartwright. Thanks very much, Sabra. Um, it's a long time since I've been a journalist, but um, as a journalist I've been taking notes. And um, one of the challenges as a journalist is to question why you're being given information, and I used to get lots of leaks, but I would ask why was I being given that information. With regard to the Clinton emails, did you ever consider that you might have been plagued by the Trump campaign? Well, let me answer this way. I mean, the ABC is opening up a Dropbox, which basically means that uh, they are doing the same thing as we do, and have been doing it for a decade or more, more than a decade, is that uh, not knowing where the information comes from, it's the best sort of security you can give to a source. Uh, how will the ABC deal with the fact that they have no idea where the information is coming from? Uh, will it affect uh, their evaluation of the documents that come there? Uh, I doubt it, because I mean, if, if that's, this was of a, 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 a concern constantly, it would be uh, no need to put up this kind of. You would have to know where it comes from. Where the what is the source? Uh, what is the motivation? Uh, and is the motivation, uh, uh, should it come into uh, play when you decide what is to be published or what not? Uh, in, in my opinion, it basically is a, a question of evaluating the infra information you have in front of you uh, uh, individually and uh, deciding on the, the basis of, of what is there, whether it's in the public interest to uh, to uh, publish it or not. Because you all know, and, and throughout, I mean, even when I was working in mainstream media, we all knew that when, when somebody was, you know, passing you a, a brown envelope underneath the door before the internet came on, I mean, it, it, of course there's some motivation behind it. But in essence, it, it doesn't really matter. In essence, the material you are seeing, if it's authentic, uh, you just have to decide whether it's in the public interest to publish it or not. Everybody, please join me in thanking Christian Johnson.